This special episode of the Danger Close podcast is brought to you by Red Sky Morning, the seventh novel in the James Reese Terminalist series. It is coming in hot on May 14th in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Go to officialjackcar.com to pre order your copy today. Welcome to the Danger Close podcast. My guest today is my friend Ryan Mickler. He is an Army veteran, author, podcaster, and founder of Order of Man. And now, without further ado, here's Ryan. Here we are. Woo, what's up, buddy? You want to just hop right into it? Whenever you're ready. I'm, I've am i been looking forward to it. So whenever you want to get after it, the library looks amazing, though. Is that at your place? Thank you. This is, yeah. Yeah, it looks, looks uh, great. Yeah, let's we'll hop right in. But uh, yeah, man, dude, thank you for doing this. And yeah, this is the library. It's uh, It was a long time coming, but now the books are, they're not organized exactly the way that I want, but they're getting closer. I just got them moved up from downstairs guest room where they spent uh a lot of time and then now they're up here semi-organized but uh but i'll get there i have my own my own uh, organizational system so it goes yes. by like uh you know i have different wars different time periods different themes whether it's terrorism or insurgencies or whatever it is and so they're all kind of arranged in a way that i know where things are so it's uh it's definitely nice not to be digging through boxes trying to find one like i know i have that and then just going ahead just order it again just get another one so i end up with with doubles of a few things uh over the last year or so so that's just how it goes i know um, i usually stay pretty organized as as quickly and frequently as i can but every once in a while it gets out of hand and then you got to catch up and it turns into a mess so yeah i hear that for sure nice nice wait well, hey, let's um i was gonna i'm gonna start with how i was gonna end because has it been a year or has it been two? everything's turned into one long day? Oh man. You yeah. hopped on and talked about the the issue that you were were having and shared that with everyone. Has it been a year or is it two years? What are we at right now? Yeah. You mean with my my like personal stuff? It's yeah. been uh yeah, it's been about a year, a little over a year, year and a half, somewhere right in there. So it's been it's been a little while navigating yeah. all of that. And uh I mean, so people know like you've been, been to the house, I, I, I met your kids down. It was last time I saw you down at uh, Hunt Expo? It probably was. Um, I was up there just a couple of weeks ago. So that's probably the last time I was in Utah prior to me. Well, years no, ago, we, were, yeah. we were back. We were back in Utah last year. So yeah, we go, we go to Hunt Expo every year. So I probably saw you there. I probably cut in line or something like that one of your book signing lines and uh said hello i'm sure yeah, I think it's been two years from the expo i've got so everything's been it's been so busy so i haven't had a chance to go oh, wild year or this year they just finished up but what a great show that is but uh man i would never have guessed in a million years that you were having any sort of issue and when somebody when you have a friend that says oh i have a, i'm working through some issues with alcohol or whatever it is you know usually it's kind of like oh it's a late at night thing or whatever or they're just they're, it wasn't the way you described it. Like I, I would have thought, like, oh, okay, if you described it that way, like, I oh, just having a little too much to to drink at night or whatever, I would have been like, oh, okay, you know. But you were sure. when how you described it, it was like all day. Yeah, I didn't actually think that I had an issue. That that's I think that's one of the most deceitful things about alcohol, at least for me. I mean, I'm 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 a pretty high achiever. I'm a hard charger, so you know, you hear the term functional alcoholic. I'm not sure if I'm an alcoholic in the traditional sense, but it was a very easy outlet for me. So, but I was still doing fairly well. So I thought in my business, the business was humming. I thought things were good with the family dynamic. Um, you know, there was probably some things I identified that I could work on and we could work on, but I didn't really think it was an issue until she said one morning, something i don't remember exactly what she said because i already started drinking but she said uh something that made me say wait are you saying you want a divorce and she said yeah that's that's what i'm saying and so i stopped drinking immediately because i obviously i didn't want that to happen so i stopped drinking cold turkey um i i uh went to aa i started going to some aa meetings uh, I think the next day or two later, uh, and I and I got some professional help, some therapy that I started looking into, and and just through the path of becoming sober, man, I realized how bad it really was. So I would, it started. What I was doing is, it was a nice outlet for me. You know, the business was doing well. We were getting a lot of attention, and it's really hard for me and my personality just to shut things down and off completely. I'm sure you can, you understand. I'm sure. 
And so uh, one drink a night or a week, excuse me, turned into, you know, a couple, couple of drinks every, every week turned it every night. Uh, and then eventually it turned into day drinking, you know, I'll have a drink here. And then it got so bad that I was, I would go to the, the convenience store and I would pick up some whiskey, you know, fireball was my go-to and I would pick it up first thing in the morning and I would sit in my driveway. It's embarrassing to say, but I would sit in my driveway and I would drink a half a pint of whiskey before I even went in the house and quote unquote started my day. And so I was either 24 set besides sleeping, I was either drinking, passed out or hung over for, I would say it got really bad over the, over the previous two to three months. So it was, it was getting bad. And, uh, and, and when I stopped drinking, it was interesting because I noticed and realized how much time I recovered. That was one of the first things I noticed. The guy was, I was do, doing projects around the house and doing new things with the business. And, and I was looking at four to five hours additional per day of productive time that I had lost through the, the alcohol abuse. It was wild. I would never have guessed in a thousand years. And I don't think anybody who, who followed you or listens to your podcast, uh, whatever, because I mean, you, you built like this canoe thing with your, like, like you're built you this barn going up. You had the, yeah. I mean, you were doing so much that from the outside, I was like, man, how's he doing all this? This is incredible. Wow. Um, like how did I think that was part of the trick though. I mean, that, that's the, that's the thing is like, I, and I said it before, I'm, I, I was pretty high functioning, you know, I was getting a lot done. Uh, but yeah, there was, it was coming at a cost, you know, my own health, obviously the health of the relationship, my connection with my kids, clearly my connection with my ex-wife. So it, it was, uh, it was a rough road. I'm, I'm in a lot better place now being sober and being clean and being back on the path with my business and rebuilding the relationship with the kids. Obviously there's a new physical dynamic to our, to our living situation, but things are really good right now. So much better than they were a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. Jeez. How was um, stopping cold Turkey? Was that, uh, were there any issues with that? Or were you just, was it one of those wake up call things and you're just done or did you? I think the pain of, of what I was dealing with was so great that it just, it, it wasn't an issue. Um, I, and, and that's part of why I say, I don't know that I'm an alcoholic in tr the traditional sense because my body never really reacted poorly to stopping drinking. I know a lot of people deal with that. You know, they have physical withdrawals, physical symptoms, um, illness, you know, uh, uh, being lethargic, nauseous, like headaches. There's a lot of stuff that comes with it. But one thing I did is I replaced it pretty quick with locking in my diet. So uh, food began to get on point, fl uh, fluids, lots of water, um, exercising, training, strength, uh, strength training every single day. And fortunately, in, in a lot of ways, I didn't have any issue with just stop, you know, completely stopping. And the amount of alcohol that I was consuming was staggering. It really was looking back at it now. But how are you training? I mean, you were still, you were getting after it still. And you were, yeah, but, too, and you were, I mean, how are you doing that while you're drinking? I would actually go, I remember going to CrossFit drunk. Like I, I would go to CrossFit and I would do it drunk. Wow. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I was doing that. I mean, I probably wasn't doing it to the degree that I could have, right? If I would have been clean and sober and healthy, but I was still trying to get after it. Um, yeah, so... You know, I think part of the thing that contributed to is I was doing a lot of jujitsu. I was doing three, four days a week for months and months and months at a time. And then I got injured. So I, I was rolling with, uh, with Brian Littlefield. He's up there with origin. You might know Brian. Um, anyways, he's a black belt, highly, highly proficient and technical black belt. And him and I were training and I did something stupid, let my ego get in the way. And I tried to sweep him, but instead of doing it technically, I just tried to muscle it and he's a black belt. So he knows how to position and how to shift his weight. And I, I had my arm extended like this and I tried to sweep him this way. And I felt this just pop. Oh, it just popped. And I'm like, Whoa. And he felt it. He was on top of me in side control. He felt it. And, uh, so he stopped, he got off me immediately. I stopped and it was so painful for a few minutes. It was nauseating. Like I was, I was almost throwing up because of the pain. And uh, it immediately was disfigured, my arm, my chest here. And I got home and I was, I, my, my ex-wife and my oldest son were out in the, in the yard. They were working with their bees. 
And I walked out there and I think she could tell that something was wrong with me. She's like, what's wrong? And I said, I'm 90% sure I tore my bicep. And I showed her and it was getting black and blue. It was all disfigured. And she's like, yeah. I'm like, what should I do? She's like, well, probably go to the ER. It was a Sunday. And I'm like, okay, I'll go to the ER. I'll, I'll go shower up and clean up and then I'll run in. She's like, no, don't go shower. Like, just go straight to the ER. I'm like, well, I'm sweaty and dirty. She's like, they don't care. They, they see worse. Go to the ER. <laughs> so, so I went in and what ended up happening is I completely ruptured my pectoral muscle. So it ripped away 100% tear away from the bone and, and it had balled up in my chest right here. So I had surgery on it and uh, I was down and out for, gosh, about three months. And that's when the drinking actually began to pick up. You know, looking back at it in hindsight, having that taken away from me, the physical element um, of, of what I needed in my life was... I, I won't say like, I don't want to blame it or pin it on that necessarily. Cause like we all make our choices and I did make a conscious choice to drink that way, but I think that was a contributing factor. So it was hard going through that injury and not having the same regiment, physical regiment that I had in the past. Um, but one thing I would do is I would go the same nights that I trained jujitsu with a sling on and I wouldn't train jujitsu. I would just sit in the corner and I would do lunges and box step ups and sit ups, things that I could do while I watched these guys train. And then when they would do instruction, I'd sit in instruction and watch. So when I got back on the mats, I didn't really feel like I skipped a beat, which was kind of nice. Actually, I felt really healthy. I, my, my body had fully recovered from minor jujitsu, you know, just aches and pains and, I was back at it pretty well, but man, having that stripped away from me really contributed to my poor mental health state. Yeah, man. What did anybody uh, along that during that time frame or before tell you, hey, hey, buddy, you are you doing all right? Because you always seemed like so with it, like all you know, yeah, across the board. I I was I hid that pretty well, so. There was a few people who knew because after this whole thing went down and I was I was talking with, uh, you know, friends and, and people close to me about what was going on in my life with the pending divorce and overcoming alcoholism. Um, I remember telling a couple of people and, and they said, yeah, we know, we know. I'm like, wait, what? They knew. And I had thought I'd, I was hiding it. Right. But I really wasn't hiding it from from anybody, not my wife, not my kids and apparently not my close friends either. But that, you know, I was a little frustrated with that, actually. You know, I was like, wait, you knew and you didn't say anything? And the prevailing reason was, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know how to bring it up or, and I didn't want to make it awkward or uncomfortable. And, and I, I'm not pinning this on anybody who knew who wouldn't tell me. It's not their responsibility to make sure I'm sober. But, man, if you've got somebody who's struggling and you know something's going on or you feel like there's something going on, I feel like, I feel like you should be willing to risk the friendship to do the right thing. And that's when you know you have a real deep, meaningful friendship is somebody's willing to put that friendship on the line because they care about you enough that they're willing to get in your face a little bit to some degree and, and say what needs to be said, do what needs to be done. So yeah, there were some people who knew that I, I wish they would have said something. I don't, I don't fault them. I don't blame them. It's my responsibility um, it's just given me a perspective that when I see somebody who's struggling, I had a friend just yesterday, in fact, um, I was on a call with him and I could tell he was a little bit off and, and I, I brushed it under the rug and didn't think much about it. And then later that afternoon, I was like, man, he didn't seem like his normal self. So I just sent him a text. I'm like, Hey, you, you didn't seem right today. What, what's going on? And he shared a story with me about a, uh, some, some, uh, challenging circumstances with a friend and, and what a friend's dealing with. And obviously I won't get into the specifics, but, uh, yeah, he was having a hard go at it. And uh, I was glad that I was able to reach out to him and glad I listened to my intuition. And uh, I think that's what we all ought to be doing as friends is look after each other and say what needs to be said. What did those people notice when you uh, when they when you did tell them and they said, yeah, we we knew something was off. Um, what did what did they notice that was off? Well, I mean, part of it was they could smell the alcohol on me, you know, uh, I guess. so yeah, that's a big that's a big issue. Um, but also I was getting really negative, um, really angry. I think that's what was, what was happening more than anything. And the, and the change of my personality, I, I got really short tempered, um, really angry, really bitter, really contentious. I would fight with people all day long on the internet about dumb things that is not worth fighting about. Um, I would let little things rile me up. My patience was 
diminished. Um, I was just a very irritable person, very angry person. Um, and, and, and I didn't have control, uh, over my emotions the way that, you know, I do when I'm sober, the way most of us do when we're sober and clear and level headed. So that's how it manifests for me. I just became very bitter and contentious. And they noticed that because I was always wanting to fight or pick fights or debate or argue about who knows what. Really? What did you get in the comment section of your, uh, Instagram or Twitter or whatever X? Yeah. Is that what you're doing on your on your own or on other people's? Uh, mostly on my own because what I talk about sometimes is it. I don't I don't think it's controversial, but apparently it is. <laughs> so you know, I talk about what it means to be a good man, and so you know, of course, there's a lot of differing opinions about that. So people would say things, and rather than give somebody the benefit of the doubt or answer a sincere question that maybe they had, I I jump to the worst case scenario, like this person's questioning me or questioning my integrity or or wanting to fight with me. So I'm going to dig in my heels and fight with them. And it was just, what a waste of time. I mean, it's such a tremendous waste of time and resources. Yeah, I was just thinking about that the other day because, you know, I go in and I try to go into my comments and thank people that, that, that go in and say, hey, I love the book or the show or whatever. And I always like to, you know, thank them for investing that time and whether it's watching this podcast or listening to it or watching the show, reading the book, listening to the book, whatever it is. So I like to go in there and, and do that. But when you do that, you also see the crazy comments. You see all the negative stuff. <laughs> so you see it. Um, but I made a conscious choice not to. I'm just not going to engage on any of it because, um, you know, I don't want to 20 years from now be like, oh, I wish I had, if only I had argued a little more on that, on my Instagram. <laughs> I, need, I think that would have been a better use of my time. Um, and I don't know if anybody's minds have ever been changed in the comments section of, of anything. Uh, so I just go right over it. Um, but still, it takes that tiniest bit of bandwidth, but I don't want it to take any more bandwidth than it does just by me seeing it, trying to respond to people and thank them. <laughs> We're gonna Isn't it wild though, that we have, you know, you could, you could jump into your comment section and let's say you have a hundred comments, 94 of them are, Hey, I love the way you write. I, I love your storyline. I love your characters. You seem like a hard worker, whatever. They're all positive. Right. And it's those five to six comments that are like, what are you doing? Like, this is garbage. I can't believe you have a New York Times bestselling book. And it's always the six that we focus on rather than the 94. Yeah. I think everybody does it. It's hard to combat. It's tough. It is definitely, uh, definitely tough. But it's, uh, yeah. Have you seen that video? Gosh, a bunch of people posted. It. I don't know where it started, but it has that guy and he's like in the, in the basement or in his bedroom or whatever. And he has all these computers set up and it's kind of dark. Oh. And he's going around and he's like, oh, he doesn't know anything about anything that he's that he's doing or commenting on. But he just like sees something, a post somewhere, and he types in something negative or he questions it or whatever. And then he goes to the next one, but he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know anything about it, but he's just going around the room to these different computers and and commenting. And it's just showing, you know, showing essentially a troll, I guess. But uh, but it's but it's an interesting little video to see because it also makes you say, oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably at least a few of these. Yeah. Well, and the other one that I see often is fake profiles. So somebody will, will, they will take the time to set up a fake account and profile to criticize you. And, and I can't help, I can't help but wonder, are, are these, are these professional trolls? Are they just, you know, like haters that don't want their name out there? Or are they even people that are friends? Like, I always wonder who those people are, but regardless, if you see somebody who has, you know, zero followers, no profile picture, you're not following anybody, yours is the first comment they've ever made, then you know you're not actually dealing with a genuine person. And and it's just best, even though it gets to me at times, it is best just to leave it alone. Just move yeah. on. No, you have to. Um, and this is not a good use of, of, of anybody's time. But uh, I mean, imagine it. I was just thinking about this the other day. Uh, like 1985, I like 1985, let's say 75, 95, even 2005. Um, you, if you, there's no investment. So if someone that jumps on your Instagram or whatever, and they see a comment that you make, and you're talking about being a, being a man and responsibilities and uh, accountability and discipline and all the things that you, that you talk about. Um, and they make a, they make a comment or they make whatever it is. In 1975, 85, 95, 2005, who are they going to make a comment to if they saw something that they didn't like? Like their spouse, right. who's going to just yeah, like exactly. rise at them? Uh, maybe somebody at work who's going to be like, oh, here he goes again. But what would you have to do? You'd have to buy a magazine, 
buy a newspaper, a book or whatever, invest a little time in that article, uh, read it, hate it, hate it so much that then you would find the address to then write a letter and then get a stamp, may, go to a post office, mail it to somebody at, let's say, a newspaper or a, uh, maybe it could be even Hollywood or a magazine, wherever it is. And then it would have to like make it through a couple filters before it got to the person you're mailing it to. So it's going to get thrown out along the way because you're a crazy person anyway. But now there's no investment. So that's kind of why I discount all those types of comments, because you're not investing anything in that comment. And that's the difference between making a comment or doing something like that in 1965, 75, 85, 95, 2005 versus today. No investment at all. So uh, you have not put in any time, energy and effort into this. And it might be a troll. It might be just somebody that's just saying something just to rile you up. And that's their that's their thing. Um, but no investment. And so I think that's across the board, uh, a negative aspect. Obviously there's a lot of negative aspects of, of social media, but a part of it is not having to invest anything in what you're doing. Um, so that allows me to then not uh, invest any time back in, uh, right. <laughs> in, in Well, that. I think there's a, I, I think there's a prevailing idea that everybody's opinion is equal and they all deserve an equal amount of weight. And I don't believe that. Like some, some people's opinions are better than others and some people's I care about and other people's I don't, you know, if you called me up and you said, Hey, Ron, I'm dealing with this thing. And Hey, can I chat with you for a minute about something? I would take that call in a heartbeat, you know, versus some random person on the internet. You know, I've got to think twice about how I spend that time and energy because of the point you just made, like there's an investment, there's, there's deposits into our relationship account and, and, when a person needs to take a withdrawal because they need some help, they have the they have the capital there to draw from, right? And so I think this is why it's so important that, as we were talking about friends earlier and having people in your corner, it's like, man, build that network out, build friendships out, like real friendships, not social media friendships. If you can connect with people face to face, rub shoulders, do something challenging together, deposit into their you know that relationship bank account, there might come a point in time where you could actually use some help and and need some assistance and you'll have the investment into that relationship that makes it a no brainer for somebody else to invest in you. Yeah. Well, speaking of how you got to this spot where uh, you have people jumping into your, your comments uh, and that sort of thing, what, uh, what was the path into starting order of man and path into the military? What, 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 what the hell were you when you went in? Uh, I, I was 17 when I joined the military. I was still a senior in high school. Dang. So so I joined the National Guard, uh, me and two of my buddies from high school. I wish I wish that I could tell you I was like, you know, I I, I always wanted to be a, a soldier and I always I wanted to serve my country. I wish I had something cool like that to say. I just didn't have anything else to do, honestly. I mean, that's what it was. I didn't have a path. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was pretty good at sports. I was decent at school. I had an academic scholarship in college that I took advantage of for half a semester before I botched that one. Um, but yeah, I, I joined when I was 17. I was a senior in high school. Uh, did a little bit of college right after high school before basic training. I went to Fort Sill in Oklahoma. That's an artillery school out there. So I, I, we were in an artillery unit. So I did, did the National Guard thing. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, we We worked with the uh, 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake. I was up there for 30, 45 days doing that. Uh, and then in 2003, yeah, 2003, uh, we got activated to go to Iraq and we were in Fort Carson. Yeah, Fort Carson doing our work up, preparing to go to Iraq. And I remember standing in the line at the chow hall and I as I was standing in that line, I saw that video. I think it was in Baghdad, where, that famous video where the, where they're pulling the statue of Saddam Hussein down. Do you remember which one I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep. I remember watching that as we were supposed to deploy uh, maybe a week or so after that. And uh, about a week before we were meant to deploy, we got we got stood down. They said, hey, you're not, you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to go train ROTC cadets in uh, Fort Lewis in Washington. <laughs> Big change, clearly. You're like, don't they have any other army people up in Fort Lewis? Yeah, I was like, this is strange, but okay. So I, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know if they didn't need us anymore, and you know, the our our command wanted to do something instead. Because I've I, at that point, I'd much rather would have would have gone home, <laughs> you know, and 
got back to my life and, and things like this. But we went out to Fort Lewis and that was really good duty. Actually, we, uh, we did like three days on three or four days off. So I'd go watch the Seahawks and the Mariners play. Cause I think we're about an hour and a half South or so of, of Seattle. And so got up into Canada a little bit here and there. And then in 2005, uh, we were activated again. And this time we went to let's see, where were we? Camp Shelby in Mississippi and uh, ended up going to Ramadi in 2005 so spent six months stateside training and then did a year deployment in ramadi 2005 into halfway halfway into 2006 and then i was out of service after that no kidding i forget if we talked about this before but uh we were there at the same time then yeah we were yeah bob yeah. ramadi yeah oh wow that's why yeah it's interesting to hear you talk about it and jocko talk about um you know blue diamond and habanai and all these areas that you know i'm obviously very intimately familiar with because we were there about the same time. Yeah, we might have been in the same same chow hall because uh, we Probably. always across the base because ours had, what were those things called? What were the, not C, not C rat. What are they called when they come in the, just warmed up from a chow hall elsewhere and they bring them in, in the like essentially coolers to oh, keep them warm? I don't know. I don't know. That's called something. Anyway, um, so that's what we had over on, on our side. So of course it would come okay. in you know not warm you're spending you know six months there or whatever so most of the time yeah. we walk across space and go to the uh go to one of the actual chow halls uh somewhere else when, when we could the anyway. chow hall was pretty good i remember yeah, it wasn't bad. people there because they were contractors I, I think if i remember right most of them were probably from india or somewhere but they were contractors and uh um i remember one of the funniest things i saw is it was it was Christmas time and I came to the chow hall and they had this big, huge like block of butter. It was a massive block of butter and they had carved it into baby Jesus. It was hilarious and also very talented. Whoever did that <laughs> it looked pretty good. No kidding. I, yeah, I, if, cool. if I saw something like that, it's been blocked from my memory. Uh, <laughs> well, what uh, what was your guys' mission when you were there? Were you guys, were you clear on what you're doing? Yeah, well, we had three, our unit had three, three missions. So we had a, a patrolling mission, uh, you know, clearing houses, that sort of thing. We had a counterfire mission, which is what we were trying to do. I mean, we're an artillery unit. So we were shooting the Paladin. Um, so, uh, but we had a very, very small counterfire mission. One of the most frustrating things is your rules of engagement. And, and one of the things that was frustrating to me anyways, and a lot of the guys, is that we actually had to wait for confirmed impact into our into our base before we were allowed to counterfire, mm -hmm. and then of course you know you can't you can't counterfire uh, it within a certain distance of civilian buildings. So these guys would roll up in their you remember those little Toyota pickups they had? They'd roll oh, yeah. up in their their yeah, I'm sure you're intimately familiar with that. But they'd roll up in these Toyotas, lob some rockets or mortars out from behind their Toyota uh, while they're bumped up next to a, a, a civilian building. And then they'd lob it and then they'd leave, you know? So we had the, we had the capacity to neutralize a lot of those threats pretty, pretty aggressively, but with those rules of engagement, we, we just weren't allowed to do that. It was very frustrating. Uh, and then a, the, the other tier of our operation and mission was uh, base defense, which is where I spent the bulk of my time. So uh, we, we would have, you know, the observation post, call threats in, we'd have a QRF or quick, quick reactionary force uh, on standby, uh, and then it was it was my job to assess whatever that threat was and figure out how we were going to respond to that threat, whether it was send the QRF or you know counterfire mission or you know nothing in some cases. So that that's most mostly what I did while we were there. But man, there wasn't a day that went by where we didn't get hit with a rocket and or mortar on that base. It was pretty wild, you know. And I remember, and I remember the outgoing too. And I always wondered. Oh yeah. You know, I kind of, how are they doing that? Like at that point, I didn't, you know, mine was very, my, my focus was very tactical, uh, meaning putting together target packages and then getting out there or going out there with us with sniper teams or whatever it was. Um, but, uh, but I remember the incoming <laughs> certainly. And then oh, I remember yeah. the incoming too, a lot of times. And I was always like, man, that's wild. That's pretty fast. Uh, just think that's about fast. Yeah. I don't Yeah, We could pick up those incoming rounds pretty quickly and, yeah. and respond. I mean, in a lot of cases we had the capacity to, uh, pick up a, an incoming rocket or mortar, launch, like, depending on where the target was, uh, counterfire, and hit the target before the original uh, rocket or mortar or whatever it may be uh, even landed initially. So, like, we had the capacity to do this, and, and our guys were very well qualified um, to, to make it a successful mission. I mean, we didn't lose... 
we didn't lose a single person. We had one, one colonel who was attached. Was he a colonel or a major? He may have been a major. Gosh, I can't remember now. It seems like it's been so, almost 20 years. Uh, but yeah, he, we were, you remember the glass factory? What was the, I remember the name and it reminded me though. Was that a, yeah, location? So, well, there, there was a location out there, right? It, yeah, but we, we just called it the glass factory and it was just right attached to it. If I remember right, like the Southeast side of our base, Okay. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it was butted up right against our base. And, uh, we, part of what some of our guys were doing is they would go out and they would recruit, uh, Iraqi, uh, civilians into their police force. So there was a recruiting component of this. And we had a softball field on, on the, uh, on the base. And so I'd play softball with the guys. And one of, one of my guys that I'd play softball with and a really good friend, Braxton McCoy, uh, you know, we'd been playing softball the next day. He went on this, this mission to recruit police, uh, Iraqi civilians for their police force. And, uh, yeah, they were out there and somebody walked in with a, with a vest full of ball bearings and blew himself up and, uh, took, took, uh, our Colonel that, that was attached to our unit took one just right at the base of his skull. Um, and he was up kind of directing traffic and, trying to make sense of the chaos and he ended up keeling over and man passed away. Braxton took shrapnel in his both shattered both of his legs, both of his arms. He still got the chest plates uh and and he's got um the 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 fragments in his in his chest plate still and so he went home and he was the first one to greet us in the plane when we got back stateside which is really cool but he he wrote a really good book called The Glass Factory that kind of outlines and documents his his story. In fact, he was on uh, Jocko's podcast and talked about it, but yeah, it was a wild time. It was a wild, wild time. This special episode of the Danger Close podcast is brought to you by Red Sky Morning, the seventh novel in the James Reese Terminal List series. It is coming in hot on May 14th in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Go to officialjackcar.com to pre order your copy today. I was there for a year. So we did, we were in Kuwait, maybe for, if I remember right, maybe two or three weeks kind of working up and, and, and making sure we got, got there at the right time. And I, when we got, when we got to the base in Iraq, they put us in one of those like big steel, uh, buildings, you know, you think of like a, a, a warehouse or something like that. So the, the metals, you know, paper thin. <laughs> and I, I remember going to bed that night and just hearing all the noise. We weren't far off from the, um, from the, the, the checkpoint or the, the entrance to the base. And you'd hear those tanks roll in. I'm like, what? Like, I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what's that? But yeah, we had rockets and mortars land that night. I remember waking up the next day and went into the office where I'd be working. And there was a, you know, big, big shell with it peeled back like a banana peel that had landed, you know, not, not several hundred yards from where I was sleeping that night. It was so wild to be in this in this environment, you know, and it's, especially for, for somebody like, like me and the guys that I was with, like we're, we're national guardsmen. So we're, we're training for domestic things, whether it's riots or, you know, emergency disasters, things like that. I mean, yes, we, we are part of the military, but it is in our daily life. Our, our daily life is, you know, I had a financial planning practice. Actually, I was doing retail at the time. Other people were school teachers. And then to be thrust into that environment was, uh, was, stressful to say the least yeah i bet i mean i work with national guard every deployment i think uh in particular though the joff 2004 so that was we we're just i mean a bunch of different army units really but uh but those guys were with us and you're right you know one guy was a school teacher or whatever else and we're kicking doors running through the streets middle of the day 11 days uh non-stop uh during this campaign but uh, those guys were awesome that was yeah oh yeah Shoulder to shoulder with uh with those guys, you know, and uh 
Yeah. Wow. What, uh, what did you take away from that experience? When you got back, were you like, Hey, I, I want to do this. Some, I want to do this some more. Or were you like, I am done <laughs> with that? I I don't know if I was, was either, you know, I, 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 my, my enlistment time is up. So I had a, uh, like a six, two contract. So six, six active years, two inactive years is how my contract was, was listed. And so my quote unquote inactive years were spent in Iraq. <laughs> That's because I was, I, I think I was six and a half, six years into service or something. And I hadn't taken my inactive time yet. And so right before I was about to, we got activated. <laughs> so I did my inactive years in Iraq. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my enlistment expired, if I remember correctly, either while we were in Iraq or very soon thereafter. And I think we had a 90 day stop loss where we couldn't get out after something, if I remember correctly. Stop loss. Um, that expired. <laughs> What's that? Stop loss. I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, I remembered it because I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm done here. You know, they're like, no, you're not done yet. You got 90 more days. I'm like, okay, I can, I can do 90 days. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I was really proud of my service. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, I, man, I saw, I saw some, some rough things, probably not to the degree that, that you have. And, and I never, I don't compare my, myself and my experience to somebody like you or other people who have, have done and seen, you know, much more difficult things than I did. Um, but, but still, that is something I experienced. And uh, it, it was hard in a lot of ways. Like it was hard to know that I remember when I walked into the place that I'd be spending a lot of time there, there was, there was some, there was uh, 14 pictures on the wall of, of young soldiers. And I asked the captain there, I said, Hey, you know, who are, who are these, these people? And he said, well, those are the soldiers that we've lost this year. And that was, that was a really sobering moment for me. It's like, Oh man, we're replacing this unit. They lost 14 guys in their year deployment. Um, you know, like the, it's likely that not all of us are going to come home based on based on this and our mission and what, what we're doing here and and how dangerous Ramadi was at the time, as you know. Yeah. Uh, so that was very sobering. And then and then, you know, fortunately, we all came home. But I, man, I think about I think about those men and women who, you know, their moms, their dads, their brothers their siblings, those people could have, you know, invented new new products They could have cured illnesses they could have just you know tucked their kids into bed and raised good kids i mean there's gosh so to know that we don't have those people it was hard to it was i'm trying to be really honest about this it was hard for me to be in iraq and not really know if we should be there and then also to feel like whether this is true or not the way that i felt was why are we here doing what these people should do for themselves? And, and I think there were a lot of civilian Iraqis that, that were, you know, we recruited these people to the police force. We had interpreters that were literally risking not only their lives, but their, their families' lives to be part of this. So I think we can debate as to whether or not we should have been there, but there was a lot of good that came from it. Um, but still, there was a lot of things that I wrestled with. Should we be here? Why are we doing these people's work? You know, I, I, I think that a lot, actually, with a lot of foreign conflict. And again, I, I'm i probably not nearly as, as, as versed and, and well-researched as you are on, on these things. Um, but, man, it's really hard for me to reconcile sending our sons and daughters to a place that I can't figure out if this is actually something virtuous, something righteous, something that's in America's best interest. That's a hard one for me to grapple with and reconcile at times. Yeah, no, I completely understand. And uh, for me, it's also thinking about those senior level leaders and all the things they said in front of Congress for essentially 20 years um, about uh, progress and just needing more funds and uh, just the same keywords over and over again. Um, that's a that's a tough one. Um, yeah. So when you come back, what do you do when you get back and what's the path to order of man? Yeah, so I so I actually so I was doing retail before I went to Iraq and I was managing a clothing store of all things in Southern California with with my new bride at the time. We we were married for six months when I got activated. So that was that was interesting. Um, it was rough getting back, actually, with between us. Like we both would admit, like it it 
I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did, especially coming back from Iraq, because we had a hard time. I mean, we were both selfish. And I'm not saying that in a, in a negative way. Like, I was worried about my job, keeping our guys alive. She was worried about schooling and the things that she had going on at home. And then we come back and it's like, oh, congratulations, you're married. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> like, it, it was weird, you know, so that was hard. But what I did is I realized that I didn't want to do retail. So when I was in Iraq, I actually took um, some study materials with me and guys were watching, you know, full seasons of 24 and, and watching movies and things. And there's nothing wrong with some entertainment and just like unwinding, decompressing. But I actually spent a lot of time studying and I, I actually studied for uh, my insurance and investment licenses. So when I got back from Iraq, I did a few odds and ends here and there. I did some, um, uh, I did some construction. I did some heating and air. I did, I got into electrical a little bit and then I realized, you know, I don't, I don't really want to go this route. So I started pursuing my financial planning career a little bit more aggressively because I had all the licenses. I, I completed them right when I got back from Iraq and, and I did that and uh, ended up starting my own registered investment advisory firm. And the way that I got to order of man is I had this idea. I'm going to start a, um, a podcast for my financial planning practice. And I called it Wealth Anatomy. And I'm like, I'll just do it. It's, it's interesting. It sounds fun. This would have been in 2014, maybe, that I started the podcast. And uh, I realized, oh, I love this. I love this medium of having conversations like this and interacting and talking with interesting people. But at that point, eight, eight or so years, eight, nine years into my financial planning practice, I thought to myself, I don't want to have the same like investment conversation. I don't want to do that anymore. So I decided that I would start Order of Man, which the goal was just to talk with interesting guys that I was inspired by so I could be a better father, be a better husband be a better business owner, be a better man in general. And the thing just took off. I mean, almost overnight, this was in 2015, you know, and here we are nine years later um, in March, the end of March will be nine years. Wow. And uh, man, just to see how much it's grown and how many people it's impacted and the highs and lows of my own life and the things that I've done right, a lot of things I've done wrong and just being on the path that like, this has been such a rewarding experience and we're still growing you know we're still evolving and trying to figure out how to impact and touch and reach more men and what they need what i need i mean i, I kind of feel like i'm solving my own problems and allowing other people to see how i do it so when somebody says you know especially as i was going through all my own personal issues and i got called a hypocrite a lot and you know there was some fallout for that and, and i don't i I see that if I'm looking at it objectively, like, yeah, I, if I was listening to a guy, I, I would question that too. But I have always tried to be honest and, and never present myself as knowing everything or having this manliness thing figured out. It's just something I'm trying to learn. So when I fall, you know, it's like, take your licks, learn what you need to learn to get back up and get back in it. And that's, that's about where I am in my life right now. And I hope people see it as maybe a little bit of a call to action or inspiration that, that they can do the same thing regardless of, you know, their relationship status or their financial status or their current health condition that they can get back up, dust themselves off and get back into the game. Yeah, man. So, I mean, you're so good at it, the podcast and I forget how we first got connected, whether it was like on, uh, so it might've been on social. Um, I forget how we first co connected or somebody connected us or we just kind of, so maybe the algorithm connected us. Who knows? Because it was early. I don't know. It was right as you were writing your first book. I think. Yeah, yeah. You were the first, yeah. one of the first interviews that I did, I think. I mean, it was in the first year. Yeah, it was because I remember, I, I think somebody introduced us and I, I came up to your home. You invited me to your home, which I, I will always remember that. Uh, so I came up and Trevor, Trevor did a podcast with us too. Was there at the same time we were like, we we're shooting bows or like, yeah. I was doing with Trevor, but we were there together. And then, uh, yeah. So Trevor did one too. Yeah. Trevor that was fun. And then before I left, uh, you said, Hey, I got something for you. And I was like, Oh, okay. And you went out to your freezer. I don't know if you remember this and you grabbed some elk and I think it was maybe from, was it the elk that your daughter shot? Probably. Cause at the time that yeah. was, uh, yeah, it was definitely hers at that time. And you gave that to me and I'll never forget that. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a hunter then actually. And so you gave me that meat and I just, I thought that was the coolest gesture and, you know, got home and cooked it up and I, I won't forget that, but I, I love doing that first podcast with you. And then just to see 
man, to see what you've done over the past nine years now, nine, 10 years to see what you've done is, is incredible. I'm, I'm so excited to see your growth and, and everything that you're doing. Oh man, well, I appreciate that. And it's, I mean, it's due to, to you and uh, other people like you that took a risk on me early on as a new, a new author, had me on their, their podcast. And then, you know, it's, uh, it's sincerely appreciated. And that was fun. That was great coming up to the other house from a new, a new place now here, um, a little yeah. more remote than that one was, but uh, yeah, that, that was awesome. I remember exactly when we went downstairs and set everything up and I was like, gosh, how's this guy doing all this? Like he's not, he knows how to work all these little contraptions and <laughs> everything. And there's the lights are blinking. Like it's so cool. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was why that was really that was really cool um i think you had just got your dog too you had a you had a new is it yeah. scout is it scout yeah. is that your yeah, dog scout. she's yeah. uh she's actually barking downstairs right now uh, <laughs> she's uh yeah she's doing great and that's right yeah scout was there um i actually got a greater swiss mountain dog because of her i saw that dog. I'm like, i right. love that dog so we right. got one ourselves yeah that's awesome uh <laughs> yeah she's doing she's 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 amazing so uh the scouts here yeah just just downstairs right now uh awesome Man, so it started. I guess I didn't realize it started as a podcast out of a financial podcast, mm -hmm. uh, a previous profession. Uh, so it started that way, and then eventually there's there's a book along the way. And were you always on social channels, or did that come out of the podcast? What was that like? Yeah, I think I think I did it right, you know, and that, and, and that's just luck. That's it's not strategy or intelligence. I just I did it right because I got lucky or. You know, I saw enough things at the right time that I figured this is how you do it. So my my method for for the organization and the business, and it's and it's a movement. I say a movement, but it's also a business. You know, and it can be both, and it always has been. But the idea was we'll launch the podcast and the website together simultaneously with our social media accounts. So at the time, Facebook groups were just kind of taking off, and so we leveraged Facebook groups. We've got I think seventy eight, seventy nine thousand people in a Facebook group for men right now. Um, you know, 300 and I think 50,000 people on YouTube. Like it's, it's wild to think about the growth that we've had, but I launched everything all at once. And we've done other things, you know, like a couple of years into it, I realized like, maybe we should do uh, events where we bring men in and, and we run these events with these guys. And we did that. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote two books, you know, one sovereignty and um, one is the masculinity manifesto. So like, it's, it's just, it's luck. It's not, it's not luck that, that I think that takes away from it, but it's a little bit of fortune mixed with just me being willing to experiment and work hard on it. Yeah. About working hard and figuring it out as you, as you go and continuing to, to always build. Uh, yeah. But that's so how many, how many retreats did you do? Cause I remember when you, I think you started maybe doing those right around the time that we met or soon thereafter, I think. Probably. Yeah. So we did, we did, the first one we did was called Uprising. So that was 28 men. It was funny because the first event, the first one, I had this idea. I'm like, you know what? This is a great, it was the middle of the night. I woke up thinking I'm going to do this event for men. And I wrote it down because I had a little field notes journal on my nightstand and I wrote it down. And the next morning I woke up still excited about it. And I, and I thought, well, let me look at places in Southern Utah. This is where I was at the time. And uh, found a really cool location, called the guy up. I'm like, here's the dates I want. And he's like, great, this is how much the deposit is. So I sent him a, a check or whatever and made the deposit. And before I even really knew what the event was going to be or how I was going to market it or how many people, were, I didn't know anything about that. And uh, we get about a month, maybe a month and a half before the event. And I didn't have a single person that signed up for it, not one. And so I call the guy up and I'm like, hey, I got to cancel this event. Like, I don't have anybody signed up. He's like, not one. I'm like, no, not one. He's like, ah, oh. he's like, well, that sucks. You're going to lose your deposit. <laughs> and nice. I said, OK, well, hold on, hold on. Work with me a little bit. He's like, all right, what's your what's your idea? And I said, I just want to bump the event back two or three months and uh, still do it at your place. But I'm, at, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to take that deposit and apply it to that event when I do it in two or three months. He's like, yeah, I'll do that. It's going to be a little bit more expensive because it'll be in season, but I'll apply your deposit, which was really kind of him. So we went back to the drawing board and, and we had 20 people, which is what my capacity was at the time for that first event. We call ourselves the terrible 20. And uh, man, it's just, I, I haven't missed an event yet. We've sold every event we've ever done sold out. Nice. Uh, so we've done the uprising. We did a really cool one called Legacy. We've done that probably six or seven times now. It's 20 dads, 20 sons. They come out and we run them through the same thing. Uh, we did a, when I moved to Maine, which is where I was before we moved back here to, to Utah, 
uh, I had what we call the main event. So I had 120 guys out there on my 50 acre property. I refurbished and re-outfitted the barn. I had the cool thing about the barn is on the second deck of the barn, uh, I bought, let's see, 20, yeah, 20 bunk beds. So I had 40 mattresses. So when the dads would come out with their boys, they would get their linens, just like you would think of in, you know, the army or, or, or Navy or whatever it might be. They'd get their linens, they'd get their bunk assignment, and then they would sleep in the barn for the three and a half days. And we'd run the events in, in town and on our property. Man, we've had so much fun. I, I do it because I enjoy it. Like, I want to be with these guys. I want to do fun stuff. You know, I want to do jujitsu. I want to blow things up. I want to learn how to shoot better. If I can include these other guys in it, man, that's what we're going to do. So it's been really cool. Really cool. Man. And uh, so how was the, the main experience? And we were out there for three three years or so? Uh, just about about just about four years. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I love it. I loved it. I've only been there I once. I loved it. But I, I mean, and you know, when I was back there, because you saw I was back there and texted me and I was just, it was in and out real quick. Um, yeah. God, what a good spot. What a beautiful spot that is. God. It's amazing. It is amazing. Um, the the place that that I had was on 50 acres and his home built in 1912. And of course had the, you know, 2,500 square foot barn attached to it and lakes everywhere you look and good friends with Pete Roberts and Brian Littlefield and the entire crew. Um over at, at origin. Um, you know, yeah, you got to put up with the winters, but that never really seemed to bother me. You know, I'd, I'd get out there and plow my driveway and, you know, we'd play in the snow and, you know, it was cold, but we loved it. We had a really good, it was a good experience all in all. Yeah. And would you have stayed there if things, uh, if you guys hadn't split up? I pro probably we would have stayed, but now that I'm back in Utah, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful I'm back in Utah. I think I think Maine was good. It was it was a new experience. Um, you know, it, admittedly, there's a lot of a lot of bad memories as well. You know, with just how everything went down because I didn't ex expect that. I I thought I'd be with her for the rest of my life. Like that that was my goal. You know, and that's what I advocate for actually. You know, I and I still believe in marriage and I still believe in the nuclear family, and uh, in in different circumstances, you know, I, I would like to think I'd still be in that position, but I'm not, that's the reality of it. So as much as I enjoyed the experience, there's some baggage associated with it. And Utah is amazing. It just is, you know, it's a little different down here than it is where, where you're at in, in, in Northern Utah, but gosh, the sun and the outdoor activities. And I've taken up this year skiing and I'm uh, going to start mountain biking uh, of course, we're right at the base. Of, I'm I'm looking at almost right here, Zion National Park. Like it's just you can't. And the people here are great. Like I love Utah, so I'm really grateful to be back. Nice, that's awesome. It's good for the kids too. That was the most important thing. Is my ex and I were navigating this divorce. Is you know, I she loves the kids. She's a great mother. Um, I'm I'm a good dad most of the time. <laughs> so it was really important that that we looked after the kids. And I think being back here was the best decision for our kids. Family here, a lot of friends that are grounded and rooted here. Maine was pretty rural. So we were kind of out on our own. Um, here we're, we're in a small town, but everybody's close together. They've got a lot of good friendships. It's just, it's a better situation for the kids, which is important to, to both of us. Yeah. And what's, um, do you regret at all uh, being so honest about what you you went through? A year, year and a half ago? No, I don't regret it. I, I think you mean with the fallout or, or, or yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't regret it. I wish I would have been maybe a little bit more forthright earlier, actually. Um, I think that probably would have been the more honest thing to do, number one. Um, but it may also have helped me get back on the path a little sooner, too. Maybe before I, uh, you know, made, made, had, had the circumstances change the way they did. Um, so no, I don't regret it. In fact, I had fallout. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, there was fallout. People were upset, rightfully so. And if I was in their shoes, I think I would be too. Um, so I had some fallout. But I also, man, I wish I could show people how many messages and emails that I got. Not, not anything about me, like, oh, you're okay. You got this. It wasn't about that. It was, hey, Ryan, you know what, man? I've been struggling with alcohol myself. I'm going to stop drinking. Or, hey, you know what? Like, my wife and I, like, we're not good. Like, we're not doing well. I got to change some things. 
And I think that I gave, in a way, a lot of people permission to be honest with their own shortcomings. Uh, and, and I hope that because I shared, I hope people stop drinking. I hope people work to salvage their marriages. And I hate to be, you know, martyr is probably a strong word, but I hate the fact that, you know, I, I had to go through that, but I'm also grateful that I've been able to use it in a powerful way for the betterment of the guys who tune into the podcast. And, you know, it's been very, and look, it crossed my mind. Should I sell the business? Should I shut the door? Should I go do something else? That crossed my mind. Absolutely. Um, briefly, because I realized that there's a mission here and it's not about me. It's not the Ryan show. Like this is, there's a mission and we got to stay true to the mission. And so let's get back up. Let's get back on course. And I think um, all in all, you know, if I was dropped in the same set of circumstances as before, I think I'd play my cards the same way I did. And, that, and I feel good about that, at least. Yeah. And so podcasts, going forward, podcast, doing events coming up, uh, you have yeah. your social channels. What's, uh, what's, uh, what's the future hold if you look at uh, one year out, five years out, 10 years out? What are you, uh, what are you looking at? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously the podcast is still going forward. Uh, I, I really want to do a lot of, I want to increase the production quality of, of our podcast. And, and I think a lot of that will come as a result of doing more face-to-face -face conversations. You know, these are good. This is good, but it's not a substitute for meeting face-to-face -face like you and I have actually done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So you get I some elk out of it. You get some elk maybe. And exactly. I, I've got moose in my freezer that I got to get to you. Cause I've never forgotten. I'm like, he gave me, I owe him. I owe him wild game. So I've got some moose in my, and you see moose, gosh, in the winter, it seems like every week you see at your place. Uh, there's a lot up here. <laughs> That's incredible, man. Those are, I've got, I've got ours hanging in the, in the living room, but man, those are, they are an incredible, incredible animal. My oldest son and I, two years ago, shot that in Maine. Anyways, I got, got a little sidetracked and start talking about hunting and this sort of thing. Oh yeah. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, more face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, we do have an event coming up in May. It's already sold out. I mean, the, the events sell out. And then what I want to do is my goal in the next two to three years is to create the largest men's conference in the world. So in the fall, this year in the fall, we're going to be doing an event in just outside of St. Louis at a really, really cool property. You know, you see a lot of these events and they do them at conference centers, convention centers, um, big, large hotels, that sort of thing. Nothing against that but we want to put the order of man spin on it. And so we're doing it at a ranch that can facilitate up to 900 people. And, and I'm going to bring these guys in, bring great speakers in, um, add the physical activities and component of it and just have a really good time. So we're going to make a big event this year and hopefully it just continues to grow to the point where we have 5,000, 10,000 people and we're filling stadiums with men who want to, you know, improve themselves. That's, that's the ultimate goal. So that's what I'll be working towards. And then always looking at ways, you know, our mission is to equip men with the tools and resources they need to be better, whether it's in the realm of fatherhood or entrepreneurship or community leadership. So I'm always looking at ways that we can get the message out there. I'm looking for new tools and resources that guys need to facilitate that. And, and we'll be as creative and wild and crazy as we need to be to fulfill that mission, to give them the tools they need. Did you have a mission statement from the beginning or did it uh, morph over time or what is for people listening and watching, what is the, uh, the mission of order of man? Yeah. And, and that's really what it is. The mission is to equip men with the tools they need to thrive as husbands, fathers, business owners, and community leaders. That's, that's my goal. Um, I no, I didn't have, I was never really an entrepreneur. You know, I, you know, you hear these stories of entrepreneurs and when they were seven years old, they were, you know, buying baseball cards in bulk and then splitting them up and selling them for a profit or going and doing a lawn mowing service. And I, I admire our, our young people who do that sort of thing. I mean, they have great things in store if they can do that that early. I wasn't like that. I was always of the employee mindset. Um, and it wasn't until I started my own financial planning practice uh, that I realized, man, the path of entrepreneurship is is where it's at for me. It's not the path, but it's where it's at for me. I, I joke, I'm, I'm unhirable. Like nobody could hire me. And that's not an arrogant statement. It's it, because, because I'm more skilled. I'm not saying that. It's just that I don't want to work for anybody else. I would much rather reinvent the wheel just purely out of stubbornness 
then go have somebody tell me exactly what I need to do, when I need to do it, why, and everything else. I'm just, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. Um, so what, what was the question? I got off, I, I got off track. A little no, bit. the mission, you got it. No, the mission. Oh yeah. But, uh, but yeah. I didn't have that mission when I started, it was just like, no, nah, I just want to start something cool. And that's what I did. And it gradually morphed into, into the mission that we have today. Nice. Yeah. One of my goals leaving the military was to never have a business card or a re uh, have a resume. And, uh, so awesome. yeah, I just never, I could, it's, it sounded horrible putting together a resume, um, or having a business card and, and giving it to people. I just, those were two things that were on my list of, uh, things I never wanted to, to do. Um, but, uh, you know, it was important also to be able to, to uh, identify what I wanted to do next, be able to articulate that. So I had a, a clear vision uh, of things that I could say yes and no to when opportunities arose. So, uh, right. Uh, anyway. I have a question for you on that. Yeah, yeah. So the way, so with my business and, and most people's businesses is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a, at least somewhat of a steady paycheck, you know, incomes coming in each month or each week or what, you know, however it looks, or maybe it's sporadic. I've always been curious with, the the author lifestyle you know you it doesn't necessarily work like that right so you're you're having to put weeks and months and years into work without realizing any tangible gain or benefit from it like do you look at it that way and and how do you how, how do you manage that because that seems like it'd be very difficult for me no the financial planning side of you is going to be like oh my gosh this is not good <laughs> This is none of this is good advice. Uh, totally. But uh, you know, I never really thought about it in those terms. Um, I always just thought about it on the on the creative side. And having read all those books that I did growing up, I had a foundation both on the fiction side and the nonfiction side, both. And then the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, as well to build upon. Um, but I never really thought about it in in those terms. I always thought about it in terms of just the writing. And then in the back of your head, you're always thinking, I was growing up on the cover of all those books that I read from Tom Clancy and David Morrell and Nelson DeBille had always said, number one New York Times bestselling author on the top, you know, and you, so that's always something that, that, uh, you know, that I aspired to anyway. Um, but just as the normal path, I didn't really think about how many people don't make it. I didn't really think about how are we going to pay bills? I didn't really think about mm. uh, any of that sort of thing. And the first time that I realized that it was a business and it was very entrepreneurial in nature was probably those couple months, maybe even the month leading up to the publication of the first book in 2018. Um, up until that point, I kind of had this vision, um, this romanticized vision from my youth of being able to go to a cabin in the mountains and write a book and send it to New York and maybe maybe you do a morning show and then you write, go <laughs> to your next book. Uh, and I didn't realize how much things had changed and how much these uh, new technologies and, and platforms, social in particular, um, were necessary in building a readership and then an audience. Um, so it did take me a while to figure that out because I started writing the book in December of 2014, I think were the first words. And then it comes out in March of 2018. And that whole time, I still have that size version of just being out by myself, which is very appealing uh, with my family, but being out, you know, semi remote and not really being a public figure type person. You think of authors, or at least I did as being more introverted and kind of, you know, behind a few walls and, you know, not really comfortable with interviews and, and that sort of a thing. And I, that was, that was very appealing to me always had been well in 2018 and to today that if you if you're going to build a readership um you'd be the outlier if you didn't uh capitalize on these platforms because there's so many more distractions than there were in 75 85 94 you're also competing with Instagram and with Facebook and with X and now with TikTok uh, and with YouTube and with all the streaming services uh because back in 85 the only thing you're competing with is maybe a movie or television right um, uh, magazine maybe but that's a little different uh but now you're competing with so many different demands on time that are also utilizing all these platforms uh so so it's a different time so i realized that and then just embraced it and realized that hey if i want to 
build a readership and want to continue doing this, which what I love is the writing, then guess what? I'm going to do podcasts. I'm going to do other people's. I'm going to create my own. I'm going to have a social media presence. I'm going to try to add value to people's lives through everything that I do. That was the uh, kind of the, the the through line, I guess, for lack of a of a better term, whether it's a post on X or it's an Instagram post or Facebook or a blog on the website or this podcast or whatever it is. I want to add value to people's lives with everything that I do because they're trusting me with that time that they're never going to get back. So from the very beginning, I was clear on that. Um, and I wanted to use all those platforms as a way to say thank you as well, the people that are allowing me then to do what I love, which is right. So yeah, yes, I, I didn't think about that stuff up until like that month or two months, maybe before the book came out. Then I realized and just, okay, got to embrace it. Um, yeah. I want to do what I, what I love doing, which is writing. So um, that was a very long way to answer your question. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm always interested. I mean, that's that again, that's why we started the podcast is I, I, I'm used to being the interviewer. And so like, I have questions for you, you know, I'm like, oh, we'll, we'll do yours. Do we'll do yours. Cause I know we're over an hour and I have to, I have to let you go. But uh, no oh, no, the side, that was the, that was the other part of it. Yeah. I never really thought about that. Neither did I ever think about that sort of thing in the military. So people should not take my advice or counsel on this, but <laughs> Uh, I never think about budgets. I never think about, I have a general idea. You know, when I come back from deployment, I realize things have been tax free and maybe I can pick up a, a new pistol or something. Like I always try to have yeah. to commemorate coming back from each deployment. Um, but, uh, but I never really budget things out. I never, it's not, I don't enjoy doing that sort of thing. And for writing, yeah, especially at the beginning, there's not much money coming in at all. Yeah. And, if you're going to build a business, people that build businesses, uh, they get invest investors or whatever else. But I put every, essentially everything that came in back in. Um, so building out websites and just trying to build, you know, like we talked about earlier, continuing to build. Uh, and part of that is reinvesting. So pretty much everything in those first couple of years went back in um, to the business to build out in, in subtle and, and, and not so subtle ways. So, but, uh, but it comes in, yeah, in different, different stages where they have it, the way publishing works, uh, it comes in different buckets, I guess. Um, but, uh, it's, it is an interesting, I guess it's, interesting, but I never pay attention to that sort of thing. I just focus on the writing, anything that distracts me from the writing and going fully invested in that next sentence that I'm going to write. It's, it's, I don't think about it. So thank you to, to my wife, if she's listening to this for handling uh, all of, uh, of that side of the house on the financial side of the house. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're doing, I, and to see, see it on, on prime now in the series and, uh, and you have a new series, I think coming, like, it's awesome to see everything, everything moving forward. I love to see it. I love when people succeed and you've been a big inspiration for me too. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. Well, let's do yours. We'll do your podcast at some point and we can go through yes. all, uh, all of those. And uh, man, thank you for taking time today. And I, I apologize for taking so long. I've been meaning to, I wanted it because this is also, oh, it's okay. It's a great excuse to, uh, to talk to people that you want to talk to. That's one of the other things. Exactly. We're also busy. I mean, you're building something, I'm building something. There's all these different demands. The podcast really is an excuse to sit down and talk to people that you want to want to connect with. So it's yeah. uh, or catch up with. So it's a good excuse for, for that sort of thing, which is uh, one of the, one of the main reasons that I wanted to, to do one as well. So um, yeah. but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do yours soon. And man, it's, it's uh, so good to see you back here in Utah, moving on, having gone through what you've done, you've been through over the last couple of years. Uh, sincerely appreciate every doing everything that you're doing with the, the mission. Um, uh, and man, crazy. Hopefully we can get together and share some moose, or some elk meat here soon. Come on up to the house. We'll grill and uh, and do the podcast. We'll link up somewhere uh, else along the way. Awesome, sounds great. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me on today. It's been a, it's been a good conversation. Absolutely. And one more, just so I don't mess it up later. What uh, is it? Order of Man everywhere across the board. Where can people? Yep. Yeah, uh, Order of Man is is our website. I'm pretty active on my personal Instagram page is where I'm most active is at Ryan Mickler, but everything else you'll find at Order of Man and, and you'll be able to track us down. No problem. Awesome. Uh, very cool. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, hope I'll see you in person soon. Thanks, brother. Yeah, brother.
Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast. To find out more about Ryan Mickler, go to orderofman.com. You can also follow him on Instagram at Order of Man or at Ryan Mickler. You can follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting. Think you know James Reese? Think again. Red Sky Morning is available on May 14th in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Everywhere books are sold. Will there be blood? Count on it.